The following broadcast is a presentation of Mount Zion Media Ministries. from the subject, God's plan for a better life. God's plan for a better life. One of my favorite passages in scripture is John 10.10. 10, and it goes like this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and to rob, destroy, to mess you up, to make life hard. But I, Jesus is talking. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. When he makes that statement, he's not talking to dead people. So when he says, I've come that you might have life and have, more, have it more abundantly, he's saying to them, I acknowledge that you have been living, but there's more to life and living than what you've been experiencing. And so I have come so that I can add to it, add to it so that it will be better. How much better? I have come that you would, might have life and life more abundantly. Abundance means overflow. More than enough of all that you need to live the life that God wants us to live. And there are some people who have an issue with that particular passage because they are heavenly minded. And they think that all God is concerned about is our life in heaven. But if you've been around me long enough, you know that I don't ascribe to that theology. God is concerned about more than us being in heaven. In fact, he sent his son all the way here to earth, allowed him to suffer and die in our place, and then raised him from the dead, not just so that we could go to heaven, but so that we could enjoy life down here. And I'm not suggesting that every day would be a flower bed of ease, but I'm telling you, God wants us to do more than exist. But God wants us to live in the overflow, in abundance, so that we can not only be a blessing for our own families, but be a blessing for others as well. See, it's, it's abundance, it's overflow that allows us to be able to bless people around the world as in Ethiopia. And God wants us to have that. The problem I see, though, in the church is too many of us rely solely on God for the better life. We want better, but we don't want to do what it takes to have the better life. We complain and we point fingers at folk and we blame them and they and, and, and the man and, and, and some of everybody else. But the truth is, a lot of that responsibility lies with us. Yes, God will do his part, but we have a, have a part too. The passage that I read for, for my text, in the Christian community, there is a verse in there that we love. We, we shout off it. That, that 11th verse that says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Yeah, we, we want to shout right there because... God got plans for us, and, and, and what are God's plans? To prosper us. And I'm waiting on God's plan to prosper me. Come on, come on, prosper me, God. He's not going to do me harm, but he's going to do me good. He's going to give me hope. All of this foolishness going on around me, the despair, the disasters, every, I'm not worried about that because God has a plan to give me hope. And then a future my future looked better than my past. And we like that part. But I come to tell you, that's only one third. There are two thirds to the formula that you're missing. And if you don't get the two thirds, we're not going to have the last third. And that's God's plan because God can get ready to reveal his plan to lay it in your lap. But you won't be ready. 
So here it is real quick today. In Jeremiah 25, this whole book um, written by the prophet Jeremiah transitions. God sends Jeremiah as a prophet not only to Israel but to the nations. That's Mount Zion's calling too, you know. Not only to Albany but to the nations. And God is attempting to get Judah to get his people, Israel, to repent and turn to him. What do they need to repent from? There are two major sins that they are guilty of. The first is idolatry. They are serving and worshiping the gods of the people in the land where they are dwelling. It's a diverse community. And so some of the people are worshiping this God and some another God. And so the people in Israel think that it's cool. So they go to the temple on the synagogue and they worship Jehovah God, their God, but they think it's cool to go worship with their friends. And some even marry and intermarry with people who worship these other gods. And so the wife and the husband goes together at his place of worship one day and the next day they at her place of worship. And God says, that's, that's not cool with me. It may make peace in your house, but it creates division between you and me. Because I don't want you serving other gods. And then their second major sin was injustice. They were mistreating the most vulnerable people among them. You better hear what I'm saying. God is concerned about injustice. Again, they were those government officials who were in charge and even the leaders in the religious communities. They were guilty of mistreating, of withholding justice, of discriminating against the most vulnerable people among them. And God kept trying to get them to come back, and they wouldn't. And so finally in chapter 25, he says, this, what I, this is what I'm going to do. For 23 years, Jeremiah has been preaching and calling you to repentance, but you would not answer. And so now I'm going to send this nation from the north, led by Nebuchadnezzar, and he is going to conquer Jerusalem, bring it to ruins, and carry you away in captivity. And God does that. And so... By the time we get to chapter 29, the people are in captivity. And you've got some false prophets going to them, saying to them, oh, it's going to be all right. God has plans for us. And in two years or so, God is going to, to deliver us, and we're going to be able to go back and get our land, and everything is going to be fine again. And so y'all just take it easy. Just sit back and chill. God got this. And basically, God sends Jeremiah to say, these prophets are lying. You won't be getting up out of here in two years. I told you 70 years you will be in captivity. Not 69, not 39, not 71, but 70. And you're not leaving. However, the captivity will come to an end. And when the captivity ends, I want you to be poised to enjoy this future that I have for you. Because this, this period of captivity, this period of oppression that you're in is not designed to destroy you. It's to discipline you and prepare you for the future that I have for you. I don't want to make you bitter. I want to make you better. How many of you know that every time God sends discipline in our way is not to destroy us? It's not to make us bitter, but God wants us to be better. And so what, what happens next, if, as I move into this passage that I read, God gives them instruction for what they need to do to strengthen themselves as a nation, to strengthen themselves as family, and be prepared, listen at, at this, to prosper even in the midst of their oppression and 70-year captivity. And then when they come out to be poised and positioned to be better when they go back to Jerusalem than they were when they left to have a better life. And this formula, y'all, works for us. It works for us. 
and I want to give it to you. And so verse 4, listen at what he says. Judah, my people, listen to me. Don't wait on verse 11 to happen with your arms folded. But you have some responsibility. There are some things that you must do if you're going to strive, you want to prosper in the midst of this 70-year captivity. Listen, this is what the Lord Almighty says, the God of Israel says to all those who are carried into exile in Jerusalem, into Babylon. Again, people who are in captivity. Here it is. Be your houses, verse 5. Settle down. Don't be anxious and excited and worried to death about your situation. Instead of focusing on your exile, focus on what I want you to do to position yourself for the better. Be a houses, settle down, plant some gardens, eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Pastor Simmons, uh, are you saying that God want me to have some babies to... Uh, Listen at the point he's making to them. I want you to grow yourselves, your families, and the nation while you were there. Grow your wealth. Build houses. Don't just live and rent in somebody else's house. Because in this world that you are in, you need influence and you need power. And influence and power is connected to wealth. It's connected to ownership. And I don't want you to be the, the renters, but the owners. You can rent to others. Don't want you to be the lender I mean, the borrower wants you to be the lender. In other words, create a system for yourself to be a wealth, not only for one generation, but he's talking about multiple generations so that you can increase in power and in influence. And basically what he's saying, so, 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 so that I can be crystal clear, see where you are and what does it take for you to grow in influence and power there to become producers, to become wealth creators. And so for us, it would be beer houses as well. And, it, and in some cases, it would be having children and growing and not decreasing. That's part of what, what this anti-abortion movement is about. People see changing demographics and they need some babies. And so, so you gotta ask yourself, what is it? Is education important? Yes. And so we got to grow, improve our families, our children, our community, a better educated, more educated. And education is more than what happens in the classroom. To be a stronger families, to be a stronger relationships, to make marriage holy again. To make marriage holy again. And, 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 and come close to me and, 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 and hear my heart when I say this. Uh, living together may work for you, so you think, but it really doesn't. Because marriage is more than a piece of paper. Number one, it's a binding covenant between you and God. But number two, it gives you some legal ground to stand on. You see, if you just move in with me, when I kick you out, you just out. And, 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 and because my credit was tore up, you put your name on the lease, you put the car in your name, you put everything in your name. And legally, I have nothing, nothing, I don't owe you nothing, I'm driving off in the car, I don't have to make a payment, and there's nothing you can do about it. Because I'm not legally bound to you in any way. And then... When you make me mad and I call the police on you, I, I tell them who name on the property. You don't live here. And so, and so 
Basically what he's saying to us, we got to do what we got to do. And you are wise enough to know what it takes by now. All right? I've, I've preached this, that part that I used before, but this part I'm getting ready to go to now, I've, I'm not pressed on, so I, this, I, I need to press on, on this right, right here for you. Number seven, so the first part is us. But this is what might surprise some of you. The second responsibility that he focuses on is that of the government. He says that the government pl plays a part in the prosperity, the welfare of the people. There it is in verse 7. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you will prosper. God is saying that the city that's run by the government, the state, the nation, if it prospers, you ought to prosper. And therefore, I want you to work to create peace in the city and to create a government that will allow you to prosper. To create a government that will allow you to prosper. And how do you do that? By participating in the government. Now, I know there are some people who are real holy, and they don't think we ought to touch the government, and they don't think um, that it matters who's in government. They say things like, it don't matter who's, who's elected. God is still on the throne. He is. But he still says that the government has a role and a responsibility. And our life is connected to the government. Let me teach you this elementary lesson about government. Government is about people. And in our democracy, it's about people who are chosen by the people. And those people that are chosen to serve create policy. And the policy they create impact every part of your life. And so the idea that you don't want to have anything to do with the government and the government don't impact you, it is so wrong. Listen to me. Slavery in America was about people who made policy. And they made a policy that legalized and legitimized slavery. And not only did the government participate in that, but the church did as well. The ending of slavery, yes, God had his hand in it, but it was about government who had people who created a different policy to end slavery. And then you had Reconstruction. And as the country began to build and, and they were creating places for people coming out of slavery and trying to create a community where everybody had access, some folk decided that was not what they wanted. So how did they stop it? They had people in government who created policy that raised up somebody called Jim Crow and black codes. All of that was people and policy. And for, for decades, Jim Crow and all of this segregation, all this foolishness, that, that wasn't the devil. That was government. After World War II, you, you, you had a rise in the middle class and blacks and whites and everybody was just coming up. Why did that happen? Government, something called a GI Bill, where people made policy that made education affordable and houses and loans and, and opportunities that were not there before. Policy created by people who created opportunities. And God had a hand in it, but it was governmental policy. Those of us who went to segregated schools and got secondhand books, that wasn't the devil, that was government. Mass incarceration that was created because people in power made a policy these three strikes you're out and all of these mandatory sentences that put people away in jail for certain crimes while other people committed certain crimes like if I got caught with crack, you know, I got 90 years. If I got caught snorting coke, I got 90 days. 
That's policy and people. Why, why do you think, why, why, why do you think that people in law enforcement ride around, I think they call them EpiPens or something, so when they catch people that's overdosed on these opioids, they can save their lives. And they said that the opioid epidemic is a health crisis. But then the other communities, they got people with you know, drug issues. The police ain't got nothing but handcuffs for them. And the jailhouse. And if you die, you're just going to die because they, they, they don't think they need anything to pop you with to save you. So you just go on out. Um, why do you think you can, uh, how do you think you can be a celebrity and steal $30 million from banks and, and, and get a little time, but then you go to cross street to the corner store and, and rob them Saturday night? You, know, may, you may get $2,000 and you get a mandatory sentence, 25 to life, but you, you won't do much time for stealing $30 million from the bank. That's policy, that's government. Where you sleep, wh what you eat, and how you eat it. When your trash get picked up. If your children go to school, when they go to school. If you can go to the hospital. All of that is policy. All of that is policy created by people. And those people in America are chosen by you. And so, this is what, what I, what I want to say to you. So, so to sit back and not vote. I, I don't get it. Because there's no part of your life that these people who elected to government offices and create the policy that does not impact your life. They control what you do in your bedroom. And so, it make all the sense to me, but more so than that, I hear God saying that we ought to be participating so that we can ensure that there's peace and prosperity in the city. And this is the choice that you have to make. You know who the people are, and you know what policy they represent, and so you have to go and vote based on your values and who best represent policies that will help you and not harm you. And sometimes, you know, we're down here in South Georgia and you think that um, it don't matter. So I work with this national organization and part of what, what this organization does is, is analyze data, all kind of data. And, and one of the most recent things, we've been analyzing the data in the elections, and here's what might surprise you. As we're looking at the runoff election, um, part of what, what was done was to look at the counties that were going to be important, the most important counties in terms of, of victory uh, for certain candidates, and it might surprise you. At the top of that list were those big counties in Atlanta, we all know that, but here's what might surprise you. There are six counties that they believe are critical to offsetting, making up margins for what happens in the Atlanta metro area and those larger areas based on population of registered voters. And here are the counties. Doherty County, Stewart County, Calhoun County, Randolph County, Terra County, Clay County. Those six counties in Southwest Georgia can determine the outcome of the election because the margin between Republicans and Democrats are so close in those metropolitan areas but the, the numbers in these counties can offset the whole state either way the issue is though st starting tomorrow I'm going to say to you like Jim Brown said to Richard Pryor when he was trying to get him off, off that stuff, what you going to do? What you going to do? Are you going to sit back where they're just going to do what they want to do? Are you going to vote 
and make sure that everybody in your houseboat, everybody around you, and, and, and in the words of Sister Ruth Harris, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. Go keep on marching. On up to those poles. And so let me, at least I tarry too long, I just want to say to you one more time, the government has a role. Now I told you about what government does, but this is what I want you to do for me. Because you know, I, I, I uh, pastor a studio smart congregation. Look at American history and the creation and the growth of America, of those who are rich, those who are empowered, and what you will see, contrary to what they may tell you, none of them did it without government support. I probably could have been a large plantation owner too if the government had given me land. I could have been a rancher out west if they had taken the land from the Native Americans and given it to me. Yeah. I, I could have been a large manufacturer if the government had given me all these incentives and, and free stuff to go out and create jobs. But they didn't. And so nobody else in the world has ever done it, has ever made life better for them without the assistance of the government. And the idea that, 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 that you shouldn't want it, the government to participate, whether it's in tax laws or, or anything, then you need to just come on, let's sit down and talk over coffee. And we got to participate. I'll read it one more time. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you into exile. Even though you're in trouble, you, are, you can still do it. Pray to the Lord for it. Pray for our nation. Pray for our cities. Here it is. Because when, if the city prospers, then you too ought to prosper. And to prosper is to be able to do better. Amen? Amen. All right, all right. I'm, 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 I'm just about through now. And then we come to the third part, and that's God's part. Now, I am concerned about you, and I'm even a little concerned about myself. Will I do what I need to do? Will I discipline myself? Will I sacrifice to make sure that I am creating a life for me, a life for my children and grandchildren, and, and I'm trying to increase and grow myself as a person and grow the people around me and in my responsibility as pastor? Am I doing everything to lead you and guide you into a growth mode and to have a better life? I'm concerned about the government because we don't always do what we need to do to make sure the right people get in there. And so those people get in there and, and, and create the policy that just popped in my mind. Can you imagine what happens when you, you have a presidential candidate who's already, a, a man who's already announced his candidacy for president, and then he, goes, he says he, his plan is to give every drug dealer life?